on Off the Ball. With Vodafone, main sponsor of the Irish rugby team. We all belong to the team of us. Now you're welcome along. Lots to discuss as usual. Very happy to say Liam Toland is with us on the line. Evening, Liam. How are you, Joe? And Jerry Thornley here in studio of the Irish Times. Very welcome. Thanks for coming in. You're welcome. Appreciate it. Yeah. So uh, the weekend that was on Friday, we had Connacht uh, losing to the Bulls in Pretoria, 28 points to 14. In Belfast, we had Ulster 13, Leinster 20. And then Saturday, Munster 21, Zebra, Parma were five points. Next Friday, Connacht will play Munster and Leinster host the Sharks Saturday. Ulster will host uh, Ospreys. We might start if we can, because otherwise we often forget them. We'll get into other things. Connacht, 28-14 uh, loss in Pretoria, Jerry. Alan Quinlan was on the morning show this morning. He was saying the trouble for Connacht is they're still porous in defence, which was their Achilles heel uh, last season. And now they're not even scoring as much as they mm. were last season. I'm no mathematician, but that's a bad combination. Yes, it's not helpful. Um, it's been tough for them, no doubt. They've had a, with the all weather, 4G all-weather pitch being brought in for the next game at home to Con- Munster on Friday night which mm. will be a good occasion sports ground I think it's close to a sellout already they've had to play their first three games away from home and if you looked at the fixture list and said Ulster away followed by um, Stormers and Bulls away you would have gone well Connacht might welcome home at a, with nothing out of that and so it has come to pass so there's no great shock there it's mm. more the manner of it particularly the first game against Ulster they've hardly fired a shot in mitigation, they had none of their internationals for that first game away to Ulster. Bundy, Aki, Mac Hansen, fin, Finley Bealham, Keane Brandergast. <clears throat> um, and we'll never know how the tour might have gone but for Bundy Aki's red card because that was about to make the score 19-15. The try was chalked out as well. So it was a complete momentum shift in, not only in that match but I would argue in the entire tour given what a talismanic, inspirational figure Bundy Aki is, the most talismanic inspirational figure in that Connacht team to see their main man go off having just come on <laughs> knowing that he was going to be not going to be around the following week either for a few weeks to come <clears throat> couldn't have been good for morale <clears throat> excuse me sorry so I do think that they are creating lots of opportunities they're getting the opposition 22 an awful lot they're just not executing they're like getting them all rolled into touch knock on at the base of the scrum forward pass in midfield it would be worse if they weren't getting into the 22, if you know what I mean. So I do think there are a few little shoots of signs there that if they, if they get a win, I think you know that would imbue them with confidence and their season could take off a little bit. But the, they have, I think it's a Munster and Leinster next to both at home. It's going to be hard as well for them. Um, there's been some good signs. I think Josh Murphy's already proved in the first three games he's going to be a quality addition. Really good player for them. Um, <clears throat> they'll have Jack Carty come back in eventually. I think David Hawkshaw has been quite good. I think Conor Fitzgerald is playing too deep. I don't know, it's a lack of confidence or whatever else. Midfield aren't firing. Um, it's been a difficult three games for their fullbacks. Um, so they need players to hit form as well. So it's been a difficult start for them. They're capable of better than this. There's more to come from Connacht. But the problem is, if they don't get a win soon, yeah. confidence ain't going to improve. Liam, as Jerry mentioned, uh, the 4G pitch is imminent. We'll see them uh, against Munster on, on Friday night on it and that was the reason they requested to have these uh, initial rounds away from home. They were putting the finishing touches on the pitch. So that traditional soft ground of Galway is no more. As a viewer, I have to say, I don't really mind the 4G pitch in the same way I, I, football, I, I less so. But rugby, particularly across the winter, it does make for a, a faster game. I dare say the players think, though, oh, my God, this is the last thing I want to be playing rugby on. So you, you've got the players' hat on uh, more so than the viewer in some ways. Yeah, look, the, the jury's definitely still out, uh, Joe. There's a lot of controversy around for the, the, the pitches and long-term effects, obviously, the type of injuries and other aspects that are kind of unproven, so I won't even mention them. But from a playing point of view, it's a very different game. And when we first saw it in... That's tone, I think. Was that one of the first places that, that started it? Yeah. All of a sudden, from five players were on the ball much more regularly. So it forces a higher skill set expectation out of out of players. So if you, if you ignore the potential negatives of the physicality of the pitch itself, it does lend itself to more ball in hand, the breakdown. There's there's less breakdown because there's more clarity of, of passing game, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. So if I was a second row or a back row, it's a probably more fun game to play when you're the ball in hand. That all said, I given a choice, I prefer to play in the old stuff. Now, I had the pleasure or displeasure of playing in in the sports ground many times, um, and it's not the most inviting of places. And 
I think Connacht have proven in, in the last decade or so that they've got a game plan that warrants better conditions and better pitches. But where it's located is always going to be a threatening place. Now, whether that becomes a disadvantage to them because they have won games or brought teams down to their level at times. But I think that their ambition is, is much more. I think Jerry highlighted a few players that are, are high. You know, you're expecting a big change. And moments do change matches. Uh, when I looked at the fixture season, I agree 100% with Jerry. Like, it was an awfully daunting opening series of matches that they're playing. And it doesn't get easier with Munster in their form. We'll definitely want a massive fixture as well. So it's a really, really tough season, opening part of the season for them. But sometimes, I don't know what you think, Jerry, but when you look at the top 14 in France, you see these crazy table positions because one of the, like Toulouse might have had five away games in a row. They lose every one of them. And yet at the end of the season, they come to the top four and they're into the playoff because we know that their ability. Whether Connacht have the ability to kind of scrape those wins during the during the various uh, international windows remains to be seen. Mm. But they have some exciting players to come back. Thornbury is an example in the second row is someone you'd like to think if he gets a run of games he's going to be a big value player Liam stay with us we're just going to get your uh, sound situation uh, sorted out it sounds like this bird's tweeting in the background there I suspect it's a bit of feedback maybe on the microphone and on your laptop on um, I mean, there's been a sizable change as well at Connacht we should mention Jerry. we haven't talked about it too much but you could still think when you see Andy Friend talking about uh, unforced errors and doing some of the media over the weekend that he's still very much in control of all the minutiae, but he is very much now director of rugby, which is not always a title we've had in Irish rugby at, at times in different provinces. So Peter Wilkins is head coach and, you know, the press release in August talked about how he was uh, going to be in charge of leading on-field preparation of the team. Now, that, that is head coach, uh, as well as primary responsibility for defence. So he's got his, uh, his plate full there. But almost like imperceptibly or without much talk, We've had a change of coach at Connacht, effectively. Mm, it's a reshuffle, the same same personnel in place, but they're, do, they're doing different jobs. So that's a big change. And then you've got the five players coming in from Connacht, or from Leinster, plus a few others. So I think I'm probably right in saying that they've had the biggest turnover in personnel, in playing-wise as well. So that takes time. And then you've got the disruption of losing Bundyaki with that red card. Yeah. And you've also got like a player like Keane Prendergast and a hooker like Dylan Tierney Martin, who would have played in all these games but are on the emerging Ireland tour. Now, maybe Connor have been hit the least by that because they're probably possibly the only two that would have been regularly involved. But you'd have to wonder, given they've already had a look at Keane Prendergast on the New Zealand tour and he played both games against the Marys, would he not have been better off playing these two South Africans? Much, much harder opposition yeah. than a Grickus team that I checked today had only two of their starting 15 from the Curry Cup final from last June. So it's not even a Grickus A side, it's a Grickus B side. Mm. Like 54 7 was pretty facile. Keane Prendergast could, didn't even play in that, nor did Dylan Tilly Marty. Presumably they'd come in against the Pumas on Wednesday and or the Cheetahs next Sunday. But, you know, he's missed the second game in South Africa. He played the first. He's missing the first Interpro Derby at home against Munster in front of a sellout. And don't forget as well, their third match is next Sunday against the Cheetahs. So it's quite conceivable that a lot of the there's a 35 players that are over in South Africa at the moment are going to be a doubt for the following Friday night as well when they play Leinster. And what is your sense of Peter Wilkins, our new head coach? <clears throat> Well, I've been very impressed and I've heard nothing but good things about him. You know, the vibes from Andy Friend himself and from the players is, are very positive. So I would be hopeful that they, they can still turn this around and have a, a strong campaign. The problem is it's coming on the back of a dodgy end to last season. And you mentioned, <clears throat> sorry, Liam mentioned the fixtures. They're yeah. bizarre the way the URC have drawn them up. Like at one point last season, I remember in the tail end of the season, which in which entailed a trip to South Africa for Connacht. They had one home match in eight weeks. Ulster are coming up to a spell in the season where they've got about one home match in eight weeks as well, and they've got this raft of home games at the moment. It's very bizarre the way the fixture list is devised. Yes, it's not thinking about the community or a sense of momentum no, at all. Like yeah. why, why, why do Connacht have to play their two marquee fixtures of the season by middle of October <laughs> in mm. their first two home games? It makes no sense to me. Yeah. Well, that's Connacht, so we'll see how it goes against Munster One on good thing, one yeah. good thing. Their tour is out of the way. It's far more disruptive towards the tail end of the season to have to go to South Africa for two weeks than it is at the start. And I'm sure it had a, a unifying, a good bonding effect on the squad. Do, those kind of tours always do. OK, well, maybe there's a silver lining there. Uh, Liam, I think you're back with us. Oh, sorry about that. No, you're all right. Uh, Munster 21, Zebra Parma 5 then. So... Munster came into this game, Liam, on the back of the two losses, as we know. 
a still no bonus point uh, win, it must be said, against Zebra here. They didn't score in the second half for the second week in a row. I know a win is a win and is a win, but still, like, this Zebra team, improved as they might be in their last 100 away matches, have nine wins. I saw John Fallon with that stat. So let's put this in perspective. I, I You know, you're hearing things, well, look, early season and Munster will improve, and I'm sure they will, but often incredibly low base. I mean, to score three tries by 25 minutes and not come away with the bonus point at home against Zebre, that speaks of all kinds of wrong here. It's very difficult to know how to frame it, Joe, because uh, yet another season, another coaching structure, new voices, etc. And we can't make them excuses for what we saw, but they are a reality. So my worry is when I look at stuff like that should be relatively second nature to the players, how they're managing the breakdown. There's, there was lots of really, really good examples of where the support runner off the Munster player looked a little bit confused in time whether he should remain a support runner or if it was CJ Stander a couple of seasons ago, they wouldn't have expected a pass and they would have gone in to protect the ball. There was loads of times where a Munster player carried in contact and either got stolen at the base of the scrum or base of the breakdown or spilled the ball. And there are areas that you kind of, regardless of what patterns you're playing, Munster looked not very comfortable in face play. Stealing, you know, Zebra's line out, they look world class. You know, we know that. But it's around the face play and the multiple face play. You even saw how Ulster against Leinster in the opening, say, 10 minutes of that fixture were, were shipping some massive hits, but still had the ability to keep their structure. Whereas you feel where Munster were to take that type of a violent defence that their structure would just fall apart and the breakdown would fall apart and they start turning over ball. Zebri aren't good enough to do that. Yet Munster weren't. They just don't look comfortable in what they're trying to achieve. Mm. Now, a couple of questions. Has Van Grand's template been shredded? Has it been thrown out? Is it, is it a fresh start? Are they still working off the Van Grand kind of systems or is there a new set of systems coming in? Has Mike Prendergast really confident in his players that they're doing what he's asking to do. So we don't know that, obviously. We don't, obviously, if we're at a press conference, we'd be asking, listen, is the Van Grand era totally gone? Um, but they look like players that when it gets into phase play, they're listening to what their coaches told them, but they're not naturally doing it. And the amount of fresh air balls, like when Carberry came on through pass, it hits the deck. I think Haley at full back made a pass, it hits the deck. When a ball carry goes into contact, it's either spilling or uh, they're losing it, they're being turned over. And there was some really good play from Zebra that we saw um, uh, uh, where I think it was the tie, the Munster tie, it wasn't it, when Knox went into contact in the second half. Scannell covered over, but not where the ball was. The Zebra loose head gets in, steals the ball, a penalty. Like, that shouldn't be happening. The three tries, Jay, were uh, mole tries in effect. Scannell on nine minutes, Knox then 18 minutes, and Scannell again on 25 minutes. And... Uh, Liam outlined the, the issues in phase play. There is tons of mitigation, obviously. We're very early in the season. It's a new coaching ticket, which is a reality, as Liam says. And 41 players, 41 players have been used games. across three games. So, again, mitigation aplenty. But still, this is an incredibly disappointing start. I mean, this is kind of worst-case scenario, really, for uh, Roundtree and Prendergast and everybody there hoping to get some momentum. And they, they have none. And, yes, things will improve, but... Again, it's very hard, I would think, for most fans to have any optimism given the rate of improvement thus far. Yeah, <clears throat> if you say that Connacht have got the lowest points total, you'd imagine they would have got out of three games. The same is actually true of Munster. Do you know to to not get a bonus point against Zebra, to lose away to the Dragons in the Cardiff? It's it's they're they're poor results and they've been really poor performances. To go mm. two second halves in a row, that's going a solitary point, or really look like they're going to score a solitary point. There are the mitigating factors you've outlined, which are are huge factors. It's a new attack. Um, and I think a lot of their shape actually looks quite right. There's plenty of players around the ball. There's plenty of options. You can see what they're trying to do. They're trying to trickle up and then they're trying to play in the two 15-metre channels. And it's just individual errors are just, you know, preventing them from creating any kind of momentum or any kind of chances. And it's extraordinary to see the, the array of handling errors that have been made by a wide variety of players. It's like quite a malaise. Really good, skillful players who you would not expect to be doing this. Lee mentioned Joey Carberry. He's one of the most skillful players in Irish rugby, you know. Mike Haley wouldn't normally throw out passes like that. Last season, he wasn't doing it. It looks like they're almost overthinking it. They're trying to take up so much on board that they're overthinking it. Yeah. Um, 
And, well, the only way is up. They're bad. Yeah. <laughs> they have to get better because yeah. I can't imagine this continuing. And, you know, the 41 players used is a factor that's been a lot of different combinations. They've got 10 players in this Emerging Ireland Tour, several of whom would have featured in the last few games. On the flip side, you've got Colin Phillips making his debut. Patrick Campbell making his URC debut and Ruin Quinn coming off the bench and making three sensational carries as an 18-year-old straight out of school in his six minutes on the pitch. So there's an investment in youth there that is coming on, but it does look like a, a lot of teething problems they're going to have to rectify fairly soon because they've got a pretty daunting fixture list coming up as well. Yeah, Ruin Quinn at 18, by the way, Munster's youngest ever ever player in the professional era. So congratulations to him. I mean, that's amazing. And mm. He got his, his Great six for minutes. Great Crescent Comprehensive and Old Crescent Rugby. Yeah, yeah. Jerry, so uh, uh, Jerry making that point. Liam, you've uh, I guess been in there when coaches are trying to bring in a change of system, and, and maybe that does explain those basic mistakes that Jerry mentions. The interesting question is how quickly will it, it click into gear and become second nature? And, and I wonder as well, how do they approach the Connacht game? Because there's a degree of well, look, even if we're going to have to win a bit ugly here, maybe we get we, we take a little slice of Van Grand rugby and just make sure we try and win this game at the sports ground. So they've got to balance the two here. Well, I, th- I think there's a couple of things we got to admit. The Leinster A team came to Limerick uh, recently and demolished the Munster A team. Uh, it was a couple of weeks ago. It was 42 points or something. It was, you know, that's an insight into the Gulf. It, 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 and always standing the emergency, the emerging tour, etc. There are mitigating circumstances. But the three other provinces look more comfortable in phase play than Munster do at the moment. And I'm trying to figure out why that is. I... I, I I don't know why players, are, and what I'm hinting at, maybe what Jerry was reflecting there is, there just might be so much of a information overload mm. in what they're doing that it will find time. But I think the monster project needs to be talked in terms of seasons and not in the singular season. Yeah, I think there's an awful lot of work to be done. You look at what, you know, the, the Ulster-Leinster game again, you look at, a number of the players that are playing for both Ulster and Leinster, they're really much better than what you're seeing in the Munster camp. Mm. Um, and you kind of say, well, how long is it going to take to get Munster back to that level? Like every season they talk in terms of, look, we're a, you know, we're a European Cup team. But on the evidence of what we're seeing at the moment, they're a long way short of it. So how many seasons is it going to take to get comfortable again? Now, there's really good coaches in the system. Like, like Roundtree is a top guy and, and the coaches around him are top people. Is there going to be a requirement to really, really aggressively change the playing staff to get to where they need to go? Because there's some of the players that are, are struggling with it. And then you got, as you said, Rurik Quinn, the old present guy, hugely talented player. There's loads of, individually, I think there, there's lots of talent. Like for me, Jack O'Donnell, as a wing forward, was desperately unlucky not to tour with Ireland in New Zealand. Like there's plenty of talent, but at the moment they're struggling. Like the the little wraparound play that we see all the sides doing now, when Munster are doing it, they just seem to be struggling about timing and where they're supposed to be. And hopefully that will come into play. Hopefully that will um, mm. that will begin to write itself. You'd be worried around certain positions like tight head. They're they're pretty light in certain positions in Munster if they ship a couple of injuries. Um, but they've got some quality players to come back to as well. So yeah, they do, Liam. How, don't they? Like, how, what difference would a Gavin Coombs make to that team? Because they're, as you say, their problems in the breakdown really are coming from not. I don't think they're winning collisions nearly enough. You know, even against the Dragons, <clears throat> they'd go through the phase and you're just waiting for a turnover. You just knew it was going to happen because they're just not winning collisions. And Gavin mm. Coombs, and they've been very unlucky. It has to be said. I know he's not homegrown product, but like. They've been desperately unlucky with RG Snyman, haven't they? Like, imagine the difference he would make. He's hardly played sure. any rugby in two and a half seasons. And sadly, the word in the street is that he might be back till around February at the earliest. Oh. Yeah. I thought it was imminent. No, I don't think that's not what I'm hearing. I don't know, Liam, if you've heard any Oh, different? sorry, what you're hearing is right. I just, I hadn't, I hadn't heard anything for a couple of weeks, but I mm. thought it was going to be sooner rather than. No, I don't think so. Okay, maybe So they've been really that. unlucky with that, you know what I mean? God, that's, that's three and years. Malachi Fakata hasn't really hit his straps yet. You no. know, the best forms to come, I hope, you'd hope for Munster's sake. They've been a little bit unlucky in their signings. And then Jason Jenkins, look at the player he's turned out to be for Leinster. Well, <laughs> is it unlucky in that front or is it well, due that, diligence? Or well, what well yeah, it? that was, that was a large part of that was Johan van Graan not picking him. Mm. Mm. As well as injuries. If you were watching that game and thought to yourself, there's not much tempo to this first half and I feel like I've been here a long time. <laughs> uh, you were there a long time, 55 Five minutes. minutes. <laughs> so, 
uh, I was about to say this is a, an issue the game really has to get to grips with and we saw it in the Lions Tour last year where it just reached uh, ridiculous proportions. Uh, Matt and I talked about this actually in, uh, on Wednesday, Matt Williams, and he flagged uh, this trial mm. which is upcoming and I saw it in your paper, Jerry, mm. John Sullivan's writing about it as well. So uh, Super Rugby officials, they're basically trialling new rules at two Queensland Reds games. So I want to see how you like the look of these new innovations or new rule changes. So just to speed everything up yep. and to get the ball in play more often. Uh, for instance, uh, a player will have five seconds to play the ball at a ruck once the referee says use it. That's uh, thumbs up. Yeah, thumbs, thumbs up, Liam. 30 seconds to pack down at the scrum from when the mark is set. That's my favourite one of the lot. Thumbs up, absolutely, yeah. Yeah, 60 seconds to take penalty kicks, 90 seconds for conversions, 30 seconds to restart after a conversion. So those kicks will be much quicker. Yep. Uh, a team will have 30 seconds to throw into a line out from when the mark is set by the referees. Again, none of this walking up and taking mm. forever to get there. And a crooked throw only penalised if the other team contests the mm. line out. And all, if, all of those infringements, if they're infringed upon... Uh, will result in a tap-free kick only. So it's not like you can say, we'll take a scrum. Mm. Um, and interestingly as well, for the advantage rule, only three phases. Because, I mean, we've all had the experience mm -hmm. of, of turning to each other and saying, do they still have advantage? Mm -hmm. They've been playing for about 10 minutes here. So Good, hard and fast rule on that. The other one I don't like, the least one of the ones, on. the, the deliberate knock-on is not going to be penalised by a yellow card yeah, I anymore. That was a, I don't quite understand that. Encouraging cynicism. Absolutely. That's what I thought. But uh, whether these work or not, I'm glad they're trying mm. and acknowledging... Mm. The 55 minutes yes. or 40 minutes and the lack of ball and play, I mean, it's a snooze fest, for, especially for younger people and you're trying to attract another game. Yeah. Watching scrum yep. sets in the URC, life is too short. Yep, it really is. Like 55 minutes and scrum resets and also the one they haven't addressed in all those um, experimental law changes is the time it takes for a TMO and a referee to agree upon something. Like the four minutes to come to the wrong conclusion that Niall Scannell had grounded the ball for the first try. Yeah. <clears throat> For the Draco Dunhu try that was disallowed, I looked at it again today, and you can actually see Draco Dunhu tell Ben Ely, take a drop kick quickly, because he knew damn well he hadn't grounded it. Um, and he did take, the, did take the drop kick, but the referee said, no, no, I haven't. I was addressing something I hadn't turned my attention to play. So then the TMO looks at it, and looks at it, and looks at it. Yeah. Sean Brick, Brickle, is that his name? It took him two minutes to advise AJ Jacobs that he should have a look at this. Yeah. Two minutes. Now, in fairness to Jacobs, I was a little bit surprised by how it turned out because the previous week Jacobs refereed the Scarlet's Ulster game and he was excellent really authoritative game flowed very quickly but then you had two very positive sides who like to play a high tempo game as well and also like to do things quickly you know but um, that took two minutes then it took over another minute it took a minute then for Jacobs to decide it wasn't right then it took another 45 seconds for months to come up the field and take the penalty to the corner so again you're talking about effectively another four minute gap oh, I'm, in break of play I'm making a cup of tea yeah. in increasingly I'm just watching rugby lean on delay and forwarding through all this stuff because it's the only way to do it but um, your, your thoughts on all that well, the first thing is that the referee's role is to change the behaviour of players whose behaviour needs to be changed, okay? That's his role or her role. And in most cases, it's the players that are creating the problem. So scrum time, it's a player uh, role. How referees referee that needs to be uh, questioned. And the next thing is, which I don't understand, is the interactive process between the player and the elite player developments. So what type of performance are they supposed to be putting in in order to get rewarded with the big games and you see they become so ingrained in what jury just rightly even listening to jury highlighting the whole process was almost do you know what i mean mm. and it's sorry if i bored you the, there <laughs> no no no, no I'm, I'm complimenting you but it sucks us into the into the rabbit hole of it and so you get, you get a sense that the referees are so afraid to make a decision may come back to haunt them, that you kind of go, hang on a second, we need to recreate this because mistakes happen. They should be allowed to happen. But if we are prepared to, to have a 50 or a 60 minute half, 40 minutes, take 60 minutes, just because the referee is so uh, pressurized into making the correct decision, I think we've lost it. We should accept mistakes will be made. Mm. Over the course of the season, of course, they'll iron themselves out to some point. But as Jerry rightly pointed out, the, the two big delays and they got the decisions wrong anyway. So it's, it's very, very frustrating. Um, like a lot of the laws already exist, but referees like the putting the ball in crooked. I know there's all sorts of, but that is completely allowed. Yeah. Yes. So like, they're going to straight into the second round now, aren't they? Nobody's... In, the, in the conditions we saw in Belfast, the, the hooker is expected to put the ball perfectly down the middle of the line out in those conditions. 
any wavering in that, it's a referee decision. Why don't we referee what's, what's in the scrum? And there's lots and lots of examples of that that can be split up. But I think fundamentally the governing body are probably expecting perfection from referees when I think we should lower that barrier down and let the game flow a bit. And equally, the players themselves are cooking the books, particularly around the scrums. Liam makes a good point. And it's not just the governing body, maybe. It's us as well. Journalism, media, pundits. We, the, the referees are under intense scrutiny now with the advent of video analysis. Or, like that second test in South Africa. They were paralysed by Razzie's an- analysis. And that's why we had a near hour-long first half in that game as well. And even high hits weren't being punished. Like, mm. That was just forgotten about as well. They were so fearful. And this gives you... They're human beings as well. And they're put, put under in- intense scrutiny. And they think, well, now that I've got a TMO, now I've got camera angles, i better get everything right. Mm. And so I think it's not just the government body. I think it's a little bit us and the crowd and coaches and players are also inducing this kind of paralysis. Yeah. Well, hopefully it's a success. I mean, the thing is, even if this trial worked out well when everybody's in their best behaviour and the laws were made uh, widespread, I mean, give it a month and mm. they'd all be forgotten. You know, like, to, would anyone really have the stopwatch out for how quickly a line out's taken or scrum resets? I'd say, especially in big games, referees would be loath to penalise teams. But if they were strong about it, it would change behaviour. Well, is the, is the big reason for the, the time wasting lean uh, bigger, less aerobic players? need rest and so the bigger teams will take their merry time getting around to all the various set pieces that's the, that's well, the logic I presume Well teams are always going to play the advantage that, they, that are presented to them absolutely but I think, I think a fast track way to solve this is punish the coaches because coaches coach players on how to tackle and if the, if the players are consistently tackling high the coaches have failed in their job they're either encouraging it or they're not eradicating the challenge in the first place. And it's the same at scrum time. Like, you know, we've all been in scrums where you're facing a much better scrummaging outfit. It has a huge impact on the outcome of the game. So you're going to, you're going to invent techniques to try and nullify that in every way possible. So coaches need to take a little bit of ownership in this journey as well. Yeah. Ulster 13, Leinster 20. Leinster were 20 points to three up after 45 minutes. So there was no great sense of contest on the scoreboard certainly Jerry. so I guess um, you know if the, if the sense increasingly is that Ulster are now the second best team on the island then uh, Leinster just underlined the fact that there's still quite a way to go fellas Yeah and Dan McFarland was honest enough to admit that afterwards when I asked him what was the big learnings from the night he said they were not as good as Leinster mm. which was quite a For now Yeah says. well it was quite a tacit admission because Ulster did after all do the, le- the double over Leinster last season but then again if you looked at the team sheet that Leinster sent to Belfast last March and compared it to the team sheet that appeared in the Heineken Cup final or the one that played last Friday night the one that played last Friday night was a damn sight closer to the Heineken Cup final team than the one they sent up, up north in March So I guess a, <clears throat> a degree of respect therein Yes, exactly I think to a degree ironically Leo Collins' was, hand was slightly forced and that with a dozen players on this emerging Ireland tour he, was, he had to go more to his front liners maybe yeah. but it was a strong Lancer team they were I mean they just quietened the crowd the crowd was it was quite subdued for that first 45 minutes, 60 minutes even. Um, it was far from a sellout. The heavens opened around it by the 23rd minute mark. There were literally, there was this noise, like as somebody just turned on a very loud extractor fan or is there about to be an announcement on the, on the tannoy? People looking around. It was actually the, the rain just, just started to absolutely cascade in biblical style. Right. And um, that ruined the game and also made it more difficult for Ulster. When you're way behind in a rainy night like that, it's harder to make a comeback. And also I think like a really high tempo fast game they show that against the Scarlets mm. so Leinster were dominant for an hour and then the game just flipped and in the last 20 minutes suddenly Ulster started generating momentum in scrums and in line outs scored a try off a line out got back to within a score and I don't know another 5 or 6 minutes and McFarren was pretty rueful about one decision that they didn't get near the end an offside that he thought was bona fide offside would have given them one more penalty to the corner they might even have got a draw you think that poor old Aaron Sexton took that quick throw that led to one of the Leinster seven-pointers and then failed to ground the ball, albeit with a brilliant tackle from Charlie Natai. But, like, had Robert Balakoon been playing, mm. Ethan McElroy been on the bench at half-time to come on for Stockdale, might they have got something more out of the game? And you have to wonder, again, 
would Robert Balakoon, Tom Stewart would have had a long innings on the game because Rob Herring's now gone for this week and so Stockdale as well. So they're without Balakoon and Stewart again yeah. and didn't have them last Friday. And would Balakoon not be better off playing in a, a top of the table Ulster Leinster Derby in front of a near full Kingspan than playing against Grickers B? <laughs> I'll take that as a rhetorical question. Yeah, take it as. But yeah. uh, it was twice, one other way. thing. Yeah, one other on. thing. And ask Liam about this. Yeah. One other real takeaway from the match was I thought it was extraordinary. The turnaround, whether coincidentally or not, happened almost immediately after Jason Jenkins went off. And he, was, he wasn't replaced by a bad player. It was James Ryan that came on. But Jenkins has just been a force of nature for Leinster in these early stages of the season. And he is a force. Like one of the, the players were talking about the influence he has in the mall and the scrum is quite profound. When he hits a ruck, like he shifts it like a cement truck. You can mm. actually just see visibly shift. And they seem to be a little bit denuded of their power without him in the last 20. Mm. Sounds like a useful tool in Europe, Liam. Yeah, I, I, I'd be interested to know what his fitness levels are in comparison to the rest of the group because I agree with you, Jerry. His his impact was phenomenal. Mm. Like he's 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 bigger than any second row we have. You know, he's six foot eight. There's taller guys like Devin Tonin, but he's got a big old rear. He's got a, he, when he hits things, people. He's like the the French second row from South Africa. He makes massive changes and if there's anyone messing at the breakdown like what we saw Zebra doing someone like him coming through just wipes out two or three players that said from an Ulster point of view I thought that there was windows into where Ulster's challenge is they have so much talent and so much ability they failed to score a try off the line out which is a real error around the 16th 17th minute they eventually got a three pointer Leinster kicked off Ulster gathered and in the in the developing rain, and I think it was Stockdale left foot, kind of a very poor clearance kick, allowed Leinster to flood back into their half, and ultimately Sexton, Aaron Sexton, as you as you said, Jerry, took a ridiculous uh, short throw in. All that happens in about three minutes, like the missed try, the 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 poor exit, allowing Leinster to flood in, and then that really bad decision by Sexton. So there is still a kind of a. Uh, the the coach's role is to get the players into position to take the shot. The players ultimately have to take the shot. So there's still a kind of an element of the destruction button in the Ulster side that's a little bit worrying. And I hope they come out of it because when they're playing well, they're they're a joy to yeah, watch. Yeah. So they are they really are a joy to watch. But there, there's there's something about just the group, the culture within the group that they're not setting high enough standards for themselves. And I look at McCluskey, who can be you know inverted commas world class. But he drifts in and out of the fixtures. Whereas when you see Leinster at their pomp, there's such a hunger. Like Henshaw wasn't letting no. s- nothing well, last it's, it's almost as if Henshaw heard all this McCluskey yeah. talk the last two weeks and yeah. said, right, let's just, let's just remind yeah. everyone what the story is. We even is. asked him in the press conference the right. RDS, in the UCD last Monday. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's a glint in his eye. Yeah. Well, looking forward I mean, to it. Even looking at Dan Sheehan. Like, Dan Sheehan, okay, he's get the scores and statistically on that. But his defence around the fringe in the open 20 minutes was phenomenal. He was in the middle of the field smashing guys. And then when he gets on the ball, he's adding enormous value. And he's just one little microcosm. Ross Maloney adds huge value. So all the Leinster players are adding massive, massive value. And you look at it from an Ulster point of view, they still have that little bit of a culture of beating themselves. And they need to get that out of their system because... Mm-hmm. They had that fixture. They, they, I know they were down early doors, but they worked so hard to get back into the game and they should have pushed that fixture out to a, a draw or better. And for some reason, they did. Now, you've got to give Will Connors, like who's a monster, you've got to give him huge credit and the Leinster players. But that's the worry for me from an Ulster point of view, that little culture of the self-destruct button. Mm. I was reading yesterday, Will Connors doing a, undertaking a PhD in safe tackle technique. Mm. An interesting choice. Mm. And actually, sorry, you, you jogged my memory of something there. I was flicking around the television last night mm-hmm. and I came across Marco Pierre White on the restaurant <laughs> talking in a, in a gravelly tone about how that was one of the greatest meals of my life. I'm not easily impressed and you have impressed me. And the camera cuts to Devon Toner. Oh, Five wow. stars from Marco Pierre White on the restaurant. So a man of many talents, Dev. Yes, indeed. There's a slight tangent, I'll, uh, I, I grant you, but uh, you mentioned Dev there and I just thought, bloody hell, five stars. I wouldn't like to cook for Marco Pierre White. No, indeed. Leinster's most capped player all, of all time. Listen, so... A few strings to his bow, yeah. With Stuart Lancaster uh, departing, Jerry, no sign of any kind of 
like there, there, there's not going to be like a lame duck syndrome here or he's on the way out we're not listening oh, no. like the, if anything you get the sense um, and I was reading a couple of the comments from the Leinster players um, of like we love Lancaster we're so sad he's going and we want to send him out in style there's a degree of like the last dance about them this season maybe and, and, and so that's a good thing almost to focus on this is our last time as a group and we really should have another European Cup I'd suspect is how they feel yep absolutely and Add in Johnny Sexton to that mix as well, his last season with Leinster. Is it definitely? Ah, yeah. He's, isn't he, I think he's going to retire after the World Cup. No, so like, I, I totally had heard that as well. But just, well, let's let's was, just presume was, it is. There was a line about an option to extend or something. Right, okay. Leo, Leo Cullen dropped in in one of the right, okay. press conferences, but maybe he was just... Yeah, um, but I think you're right. They will want to do it for Stuart Lancaster. They, I think he's hugely popular. He's had a pun- really transformative effect on Leinster when you think of when he came in mm. and where they were at and what he helped to achieve with admittedly a great clutch of players um, and you're right they've just come off a trophy this season for the first time in six years and that's going to be huge motivation for them like they're itching for the Sharks on Saturday because their last defeat in the RDS was against the South African side in the semi-finals of the URC and of course I venture you know Nobody beats them three times. Ulster didn't beat them th- for a third time in a row. And I'd say they'd, beat, they'd love to get another crack off La Rochelle. Mm. They, also have the, they also have the final in the Aviva. It's about time the final came back to the Aviva. The Irish rugby deserves the final in the Aviva. When was it there? Was it Toulon the last time? Yeah. And like, you know, there's been snide comments in UK media about, oh, why, why Dublin? Why the Aviva? It's only 50,000. Because it's a guaranteed sellout, number one. And because Irish fans probably support this tournament better than anybody else who are going abroad. So I don't think it's unjust that occasionally it comes by way of Dublin. And that's, that's a great carrot for them. Because, like, the, the home advantage in semi-finals or finals is just enormous in the Heineken Champions Cup. So they've got that carrot of maybe maybe getting to a final in the Aviva Stadium in Stuart Lancaster's last game mm. and potentially Johnny Saxon's last game. So that's a huge... I believe one of the players even mentioned, I think Robbie Henshaw said last week, that even in the immediate aftermath of the disappointment in Marseille against La Rochelle in the dressing room, Johnny Sexton said, next year, remember, lads, we've got the final in the Aviva. So I do think there's a huge resolve to get there. And you're right, I agree with you. I think they have been a little bit unlucky. Like the one year they were unbeaten all season, um, you know, the pandemic hit and they had to play a quarter final, a rearranged quarter final against Saracens in an empty Aviva. Would they have lost that in a full packed, throbbing Aviva with five or six? Saracens fans and 50,000 plus Leinster fans mm. they lost a final away to La Rochelle they lost a semi-final away to La Rochelle it's um, can't it's, be unlucky in the world though well I just think you have to admit they've been the most consistent side in Europe for yes. the last six years no, another team gets in a great moment beats them and yeah. fades away and then yeah. Leinster stay there they're the constant yeah and I, you, you touched on something there Jason Jenkins looks like a very shrewd signing you yeah. think back to previous Leinster winning, Heineken Cup winning teams Nathan Hines Brad Thorne they've always had that yeah Foreign bull in the second row. Yeah. Uh, just one last very quick point. Jerry mentioned the emerging Ireland uh, tour, Liam. So on Friday, they beat the Grickass. Next game, Wednesday, the Pumas. Not the stiffest opposition. This is, uh, it hasn't even really caught the imagination. I mean, th- th- there's off Broadway and there's this. I, are you scratching your head at this tour or you think, well, whatever? Well, I, when I was on a few weeks ago, Joe, I w- you were asking about the tour and I said, obviously, the out half position was probably the key reason for the, the purpose of the tour. Yeah. Uh, and for the Irish management to get a deeper insight into the character, not necessarily the playing ability, but the character of some of the players that they don't work with that readily. And I think if the tour comes back and Andy Farrell has has got two or three characters, especially at our half, I think it'll be success regardless of the results and regardless of the, the lack of razzmatazz around it. I think they've probably benchmarked this for different reasons. Certainly winning the Test Tour in New Zealand gives Andy Farrell a huge sense of ability to make these decisions. If they'd been beaten in New Zealand, I don't think this tour would have gone ahead. Right. So it's an experiment. But until you ask him, Joe, maybe you might ask him, what was his number one reason for going to South Africa at this time of year? And I'd be surprised if it wasn't around the character of some of the players. Okay. He really needs to know, can he trust them at a higher level? And can he trust them to put them into the higher level and fast track some of these guys? But he's, he's not even there. Mm. Well, like, I know there's people, he's got his eyes and ears there, but you know, mm. it's just, mm. even that he's not there is strange. Well, Liam's absolutely right. This tour was not part of the original four-year World Cup plan, quote-unquote. It only came into being in the light of Ireland having a very, very hugely successful tour of New Zealand, which as well as winning the series against the All Blacks also featured two games against the Marys, which were 
invaluable in terms of the growth of a lot of the players there. Like 41 players used, plus Michael Bent. A good 16 of them, I think, only played in the Marys games. So, like, you know, that's an investment in them. And they look how much they learned going from the first game to the second game. And had this tour have been a remotely similar quality, you'd have applauded it. Yeah. But it's against... As I said earlier, Grick is B stroke seaside. The greatest achievement is almost the way they've managed to keep all the head coaches from saying anything publicly, the provincial head coaches. Oh, they're, they're well, put it this way Graeme Rountree's the new kid in the block as a head coach, and he's obviously good mates with Andy Farrell and Mike Catt, isn't he? Um, and if you step out of the line, if you step out of line, you'll have David Nusaforo coming down here. So, Dan McFarland, I asked him about it on Friday night. He said, Ah, Jerry, don't poke the bear. I'm <laughs> delighted to see all my players performing so well in the tour. Right, okay. And, you know, that's what they have to say. They have to toe the party line. This is not a democracy, no. No, <laughs> indeed. So uh, our rugby and off the ball is with thanks to Vodafone, main sponsor of the Irish rugby team. We all belong to the team of us. Liam, appreciate it. Thank you very much, Liam Toland. Take care, Joe, and uh, good to see you last Saturday night, uh, Jerry. Yes, likewise, Liam. <laughs> I won't ask. Jerry Thornley of Lansdown, the Irish Times. Oh, uh, all right, OK. Very good. Jerry Thornley of the Irish Times, thank you. Cheers, thank you. Monday Night Rugby on Off The Ball with Vodafone, main sponsor of the Irish rugby team. We all belong to the team of us.